This is Words Aptly Spoken, which comes from Proverbs 25:11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The written word is a precious treasure. We want to preserve written knowledge for God's glory and as an anchor to the history of the church and its classical conversations. We hope to encourage the reading of words and of the word. So welcome to Words Aptly Spoken, where Jennifer Courtney, Tim Knotts, and I discuss books from the Classical Conversations Curated Curriculum. It's Wednesday, February 21st, 2024, and I'm Lee Bortons. Joining us today, we have Kelly Wilt, Curriculum Developer for Classical Conversations Multimedia, and she's going to be joining us this week, this month, for, to talk about a variety of our products. So Jennifer, why don't you fill in on this month's theme? Yeah, we're talking about things that can really enhance your family's homeschooling, like Prescript's cursive writing, um, which, by the way, I just heard that a lot of schools are are now going back to mandating cursive writing. So for some of the reasons that we talked about in the Prescript's episode, so that was an interesting fact this week. So we talked about Prescript's cursive writing. We talked about class locks and facts, history cards. Today, we're going to tackle the artist and composer cards, and then we'll finish up the month with classical music for dummies. Well, thanks. So you can access all of our past episode on my, at my leap. At my YouTube channel, which is at Lee Bortons, that at Lee Bortons throws me every time, but it's at Lee Bortons, or you can go to my website, leebortons.com, and there's both the archive of last year's episodes as well as this year's episodes with links to be, to um, books to purchase, as well as information on the YouTube videos. So hopefully you'll be um, joining us in our expanding library of ideas and ways to think about literature from a classical perspective. So thank you, Jennifer and Tim, for being here with me each week. Yeah, absolutely. I'm particularly excited about today um, because I'll share a story at some point. This is like a little teaser <laughs> about how I um, used art yesterday in Challenge 4 to enhance our understanding of the Aeneid. So, um, but we'll focus for a moment on the classical acts and facts, artists and composer cards. But there are some places in the curriculum quite a few times, Lee, where we have students look at art or listen to music and attend to what they're seeing and hearing. Um, when you were forming classical conversations in our curriculum, why did you feel like that was an important part of a classical Christian education? You know, when I was starting classical conversations, I'd already been homeschooling for a dozen years. And I'd led a lot of homeschool co-ops and helped with homeschool newsletter, ran the homeschool group, did some math clubs, like I'd done a variety of things. And I became very aware of things that I was very good at and things that I was not good at because of my friends homeschooling around me. And so in putting our curriculum together, I tried to address both sides of that, knowing that everybody's going to you know, have strengths and weaknesses. So one of my weaknesses actually is uh, music, classical music in particular. Uh, we happen to be pretty good at art in our family, but music just kind of went by the wayside. So I wanted to make sure that both were in the curriculum because I knew how important art lessons were and how much our family loved to participate in that, you know, the fine arts, lots of times it's called. But then, you know, people forget too that um, art and music are really related a lot to sports and our family was very involved in sports. It's all art and music and sports are like whole body education. So it was just really important to have that because of, of uh, both strengths and weaknesses in my own community at the time. But then, of course, as we got to know what classical education was and learned about it more and more over the decades, we began to realize that it was um, a good reason. There was good reason that we were strong and weak in this. The church has always supported the idea of singing and praising to the Lord. So that's why we had a lot of people who were really good at instruments in our community and others that just were not. So just from a Christian perspective, from a classical perspective, art and music is just two of, you know, many, many ways that we can express our love of life and our appreciation for what the Lord has given us. So it was just natural to be part of what we were doing together each week. Yeah, I, I love that. And one of the things that, as you said, Lee, sometimes it's hard to fill in all the gaps of the things that we're not good at. And so we're going to talk about these artists and composer cards today, which is one way to fill in your gaps. Um, the other way that I have filled in my gaps with um, appreciating art is that when I go to a museum, I ask for the children's audio because they tell you much more interesting things on the children's audio than they do on the adult audio. And it's a great way um, they 
they always help you attend to what is in front of you and appreciate the beauty. And um, so that's one great way that I have filled in that gap for me. So I was going to say, that sounds like you got maybe a little nudge on that from C.S. Lewis, because he didn't think there was such a thing as children's books and adult stories, that there was always just good stories. Yes. Yeah. Everyone should look at the art like a little child, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, Kelly, on that note, we're going to look at, I think Emma has some images to, sh to show us, but I want you to tell families about all the features and content that is on the classical acts and facts artists and composer cards. Oh, Jennifer, I would be delighted to. And if you happen to tune into last week's um, Words Aptly Spoken, you probably heard that I'm a raving fan of our cards um, in our curriculum and how versatile they are. And this set is no exception. So um, as Emma's pulling those up onto the screen, um, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the ways that we have used these um, in our own home. So as you're looking at the card, you may notice if you have seen the classical acts and facts timeline cards there is a visual similarity to those cards and a lot of the visuals that you see are similar in both organization and also in aesthetics. So on this particular artist card, which to tease like Jennifer, we will be using as a springboard for conversation in just a bit. The first thing you may notice is a beautiful piece of artwork. Um, and these images are so crucial for our students to see, um, not only to appreciate, but also perhaps to imitate. So one of my favorite stories about how our family has used these sets of cards when our children were small was that I took the uh, card that we have in our set for Leonardo da Vinci. And when you think about Leonardo da Vinci, you typically think about the piece of art that features on the front of that card, which is the Mona Lisa. And um, I remember scouring the internet for a large image and I printed out three of them with our printer at home. That's probably not legal. So I probably shouldn't be saying that on this book club, <laughs> but it was just for at home use. So hopefully I won't get in too much trouble for that. But I remember um, taking them and I cut them right down the center and I glued that half half Mona Lisa onto a piece of construction paper and I gave one to each of my children and I told them I said what would happen if Leonardo had only painted one half of the Mona Lisa I said can you show me what you think the other half would look like well I thought this was just going to be an exercise in imitation but it turned into an exercise in imagination so one of my children had a Mona Lisa with a lightsaber <laughs> One of my children had a had a Mona Lisa with a hairbrush and just different things. And it was interesting to see how they copied the form, but then they added their own imaginative details, which was so wonderful to see. So on this front cover of this card, you see a beautiful image. You also see down in the bottom left, a self-portrait of the artist. And our cards extend way back into ancient eras. So obviously you're not going to see photographs from them, but quite often will include a sculpture of the artist or perhaps a painting of the artist. And what you see here is a self-portrait of the artist Renoir. Um, under the image, you also see the, the title of the piece of artwork as well as where it hangs so that it can be located. Um, and then at the very bottom of the card, you see his, his name and the era in which he lived, which is also important because as our students are memorizing a timeline of information and foundations, we definitely don't want for them to isolate this knowledge. We want them to integrate it into that timeline that they're already memorizing. So Emma, if you want to turn to the back of the card um, and pull up that image, you'll also notice again, like I said before, similarities to our classical acts and facts timeline cards just in case your cards happen to make it into a scatter on the floor. We have numbers in the top right hand corner to help you very easily put them back in chronological order. And um, just with our as with our timeline cards, you see the title of the card, as well as the era repeated on the back and several paragraphs of information about the artist, 
um, when the artist lived, what they were known for, um, connecting threads that help your student to be able to weave this particular person um, into that tapestry of history. One thing that is different about the back of these cards, as opposed to our classical acts and facts timeline cards, you may notice along the left side of the card, there is a spectrum of color that ranges from almost a whitish yellow at the bottom all the way up to burgundy at the top and you'll see two little um two little slivers that look like top corners of timeline cards that's exactly what they are these are timeline cards so that as you are reading this information as a family you can say to your child oh Okay, so this artist lived during the time between these two timeline events, and it helps your student to be able to triangulate exactly when this artist was creating or composer was composing. And just like our timeline cards, if you look at the very bottom of the card, you'll see a map of the world. And on that map, there will be a dot. So then not only can we find this person throughout time, we can locate geographically where they lived. So again, just like our classical acts and facts timeline cards, I am a huge fan of these cards as well. They are a very valuable resource for you and your family, not only in foundations, which Jennifer, you've already hinted to, but all the way up into challenge. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I used them a lot with my kiddos and essentials. I had one that, um, when we got to the faces of history event each year, she was fantastic at doing a keyword outline. As long as you let her have a line for each sentence on whatever her source was. So then you can guess what happened when we got to faces of history and wanted to write about someone and we got a library book <laughs> that that was not going to work. And so in order to train her to start picking facts, it was much easier to take one of these cards um, and have a little narrow the universe for her a little bit and say, okay, you still can't have something for every sentence on your outline, but here's something before you get to the harder job of summarizing a whole book, let's pick some facts out of one of these cards. And so those often served as our first source for her faces of history projects and essentials. So, all right. Well, so we've got a good sense um, of what the resource itself is, but I want to talk some more about why art and music are so important to our education and why we want to share them with our families. So as classical educators, home educators, we often talk about three transcendentals and transcendental is a big word, but um, the three transcendentals are truth and goodness and beauty. And sometimes the hardest one for us to talk about is beauty because we all want to tell our kids the truth and we have scripture as our source of truth and we have a pretty good grasp on goodness and training our children's character. And then we get to beauty and we go, I have no idea how to celebrate that with my family. <laughs> so I'm hoping we can talk for a few minutes about why it's important to do that, how we can recognize beauty, how we can celebrate it. So Tim, do you want to kick us off in that conversation? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for giving me the, uh, the college, college or post-college <laughs> topic yeah. to discuss. Um, Not the softball question. <laughs> right. Um, no, but this is something I love to, I do love to think about. And um, transcendental is a big word. Um, it really, I mean, it helps us think about the, the slightly shorter version of transcendent, something that is, that goes above and beyond uh something else so so these things these three things truth goodness and beauty all transcend any one thing right there's no one work of art there's no one song there's no one single thing that can capture all of beauty any more than there's any one statement that captures all of truth or any one action that captures all of goodness uh some things are more good than others more Right, it contain more truth than others, but they're but they don't contain all of it. It's its own thing that transcends any one object, uh, any one artifact. Um, and so, our our kids do know these things. Uh, you know, they get into fights. My kids get into fights all the time about what 
what's good and what isn't good, right? He he did something that I didn't want him to do. Well, is that good or bad? Or is it just something you didn't like? <laughs> um, we have that conversation a lot. Or uh, or when it comes to truth, someone, you know, someone accuses somebody else of being a liar. And we have to have that conversation about the difference between maybe being mistaken or misunderstood uh, and being a liar. But we know the difference between truth and falsehood. Um, and our kids do know beauty. Uh, They'll point it out to us if we listen. Uh, you know, they'll see something and say, "Wow, that's really pretty." Uh, and I think sometimes our temptation is to sort of brush that off and to think, "Oh yeah, yeah, you know, of course, that you know, little kid thinks that's pretty fine." But it's really important to cultivate that, just the way that we want to cultivate truth telling and we want to cultivate good behavior, good acting toward our neighbors. We want to cultivate. Um, seeing and identifying beauty and encouraging that in our students. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about the reason why in his essay, The Weight of Glory, where he talks about the fact that God is all beautiful and that our souls naturally long to participate in beauty because we long to be with God. And I think that's a beautiful avenue for us to talk to our, our children about this transcendent idea uh, Michelangelo, since we're talking about artists and composers, Michelangelo said, uh, while insolent and foolish people concoct a false notion of beauty, reducing it to the level of their senses, beauty comes from heaven and will lead any sane spirit to the place from which it came. Mm-hmm. We, have, we have this opportunity in talking about beauty to talk about things that are more than this world and also less than this world in some ways you know a a sun a beautiful sunset is worth contemplating um but it comes and goes it it comes and goes in in mere moments at times uh and it changes um and no one sunset is like any other sunset no one beautiful painting is exactly like any other beautiful painting or or song and so trying to find what the things are that make something beautiful is a lifelong endeavor we're Mm -hmm. not going to get there with our kids for trying in in five minutes or even in five months of giving them some kind of a unit study on art but as we Mm -hmm. keep exposing them to it and talking to them about it and asking them what do they find lovely in this lovely thing uh, Mm -hmm. they'll grow in their ability to talk about it and we'll grow in our ability to see what our children see as beautiful And so we need to be both a a sharer of beautiful things and a listener um, as as our kids tell us about the beauty that they see. And remember that it's it's a learning in layers process. If you take them to the art museum, which you should do, the first time you go, they're probably not going to be able to sit there and ooh and ah over the paintings the way that you would and and maybe you would like them to. But maybe the seventh time you take them to the art museum, some of those things start to sink in and they start to be excited about seeing some of the paintings that they know are waiting for them there. Uh, Or they can start making some connections and say, yeah, why is it that a bunch of these people love painting fruit? (laughs) What's up with that? And you can have some great conversations comparing them and saying, well, what's, uh, what is it that's that's attractive about that fruit in this painting. And how is that compared to this other painting over here? Oh, that's great. I I appreciate your reminder to us, not just to be with them and train them to look, but also to take their offerings that they bring to us. Cause that is very important when they have those recognitions for us to listen and enter in and celebrate the beauty that they're seeing. Sometimes we forget to do that. That's a good, that's a good word. I think one reason you have a lot of kids too is that probably one of them will be really different from you, if not all of them. And I know my John was the one, our second son, who he was just driven by beauty his whole life and he still is. His entire career is wrapped around beauty. And I remember him being 17 and, you know, I was just driving him home from a basketball game and he yelled, stop the car. And I got, I stopped, pulled over and he jumped up onto the roof and he said, can you see the sunset over that hill? And so, you know, little children do that a lot. And it's really beautiful when you see those supposedly cynical teenagers, they're still doing it. And I think something that was really helpful to him 
because uh, he naturally came to it, but all of our boys had lots of art lessons and lots of art museum opportunities, and they just kind of knew it was in the uh, Bortons, and my, I have professional artists in my, in my Brian, my maiden fa uh, name family, and so they just kind of knew that's what we were going to do, so the culture around them really did help. And that's where I know that um, why music was hard for me, because my family does not have a culture of music. And so I love that, that we're in community because someone like Kelly could have told me things to do, right? Because she's so creative and engaging those younger children. So I just really appreciate that, all the things you bring and your philosophy right behind it all too, Tim. There's just so many ways we can help each other to see the unseen and recognize beauty does exist. Well, I think you're right. I think you're right, Lee. And when we weave that culture into our family cultures, there's such a blessing to seeing that echoed with our children's appreciation. I, I went on a business trip with my husband to New York City a while back and we went to the Met and it was a glorious day because my soul was completely fed <laughs> by seeing all of these artists who I just have such an appreciation for. And my husband did not come from a family with a culture for art in that way. So I was leading him by the nose through the Met, just exclaiming wildly <laughs> that we were in the same room with a particular piece of art. And he told me it was the best day of the trip. And we did some pretty amazing things on that trip. But for him to say that um, was so meaningful to me. And I remember we went into one room and, and in the room was a, a, a painting that was much smaller than I thought it would be in person, but it was the Madonna, Berlingieri's Madonna that features in another CCMM product, Marvelous to Behold. And I remember I whipped out my phone and I'm covertly trying to take a picture and I sent it to my children and oh my goodness, the chat just erupted. They were all like, oh my goodness, you're really there in the same room with this piece of art. And it just, my heart just sang because I think it was at that moment that I realized the, the benefits, not only in the, the temporary, you know, enjoyment as a family, but that we are, we are cultivating souls as we introduce them to these transcendental ideas that Tim was speaking about. That made, that day made me one happy mama too. And I, I'm glad my phone wasn't taken away in the Met for snapping a picture of this piece of art. I'm admitting to a lot of covert things here today <laughs> on this call, but it was a delight. <laughs> Yeah, it was a delight to share that with my children, who I knew appreciated it just as much, if not more than I did. <laughs> well, one thing we also can do as homeschoolers is tell each other about the opportunities. I know the entire time I was homeschooling my children, we regularly went to operas and took um, symphony concerts and the things that I knew that like would not be what I would normally do. I would ask my friends who were musical, take me, tell us. You know, and even to this day, we have a couple of concerts coming up and the homeschoolers that work at the Math Map here with me. Uh, you know, they may or may not attend, but they know about it and they tell me what concerts are in their church. And, um, you know, I just wonder if our children were at public school, maybe I'm wrong, maybe what happened there. But my children's network and then their continuing network of friends try to push each other towards beauty. They just want it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's cultivating the taste too, right? I and mean, most of us have a just just like our natural taste. Like if you go around to restaurants and look at the kids' menus, it's chicken fingers and mac and cheese and sliders, right? And those are yummy. They're, they're tasty food, but but it's sort of lowest common denominator uh, when it comes to beautiful culinary work and uh, the things that are on the radio that some of them have some beauty to them. They're not all ugly. They're not all right. with, without beauty, but they're, they're the junk food <laughs> of beauty. And we need to train ourselves and our children's taste up toward better things, things that are more beautiful. Yeah. One of the arguments I would, go oh, ahead, Jennifer. Oh, I was just going to say one of the moments in our homeschool that really did leave my jaw dropped is when we were reading through a children's Bible in the mornings. And we started reading all of God's instructions for the, for the tabernacle in the wilderness. And my kids could not get enough of that. They wanted to pause and think about what the curtains look like. And then I had to look up every single jewel in that, in the priest's breastplate, because they had to know what color is that one? What does it look like? And I remember um, just thinking, yeah, 
And I actually said out loud to my kids, yes, the Lord did not say throw up some sticks and throw a goat skin over it and worship me there in the wilderness. This is indescribably beautiful. And they were captivated by it. And we probably could have spent the whole year just looking at all of those elements of the tabernacle. And it was a great reminder to me to, that the Lord does dwell in beauty and love beauty. And that makes us want to look at it too. So I'm sorry, I cut you off, Lee. No, that was fun. That's fun. <laughs> Did you okay. want? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're probably about at time for our break and commercial. And then we are, Tim and Kelly are prepared to lead us through an actual discussion of the painting that we saw earlier. So I'm excited about that. So I want to thank our sponsor, classicalconversationsbooks.com, where the books we've discussed can be purchased. And we have a lot of other books about beauty that we'll be going over in the podcast over the upcoming episodes. So I just invite you to look through the entire curriculum. We have um, the entire 2023 Words Aptly Spoken ca uh, book calendar of podcasts at LeeBortons.com, as well as links to the specific books on the ccbooks.com site. And, you know, one thing that I think is just really important is um, as we, we talked more about you know, visual art, and I know we're going to talk about musical art, but just to welcome you into next week's conversation, we're going to be talking about classical music using our book, not the best title, but it's a really good book, Classical Music for Dummies, and um, maybe through humility, that's when we say, yeah, I'm a dummy, I need to know more, and I just love that book that we're going to be reading next week, because it really invited me into an area of beauty I had not been trained in. So hope I see you. I like that. And I actually do. I know sometimes we cringe at those titles. I actually own the idiot's guide to learning Latin. <laughs> I think at least dummy sounds nicer than idiot. But, um, but that book has actually been always very valuable to me because it started at the beginning and told you the things you needed to know before you started studying Latin. So I can appreciate that those resources, even if we don't love the titles. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, normally at this point in the show, we would do a close reading because we're normally talking about books, but today, since we're talking about art, we're actually going to look at a piece of art and discuss it. So if you go on to pull up Tim's image of the Renoir, and I must admit Renoir is one of my favorite artists. So, you know, I'm coming in biased. <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah, what we're going to do with uh, most of the rest of the time, I think is going to spend it looking at this exactly how we could do it in our homes or in community and how as parents or, or tutors, we can spend some time with this and not just tell everything we know, but instead have a great conversation about it. So a great place to start is asking, what do you see here? I'm just intrigued that there's lights hanging on what looks like the middle of nowhere. I would mm. like to know what's above that. <laughs> yes. And I can't tell, I was thinking that too, Lee, the light in the painting is really interesting. It looks like it's being filtered through the trees and creating these dappled shadows. So the lights don't look like they're on to me. <laughs> I can't tell. I might need to study it closer. Well, and with the lights and the and the trees, we also notice what else is in this picture. Lots and lots of people. People. So, um, what are those two people who are at the very forefront of the picture? What do you think they're looking at? Why aren't they looking at the other people behind them? Yeah, that think? one lady's looking towards the young man, but together they're kind of referring to something behind him, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Looks like it. it does. It does. Why do you think they're not looking at the dancers? <laughs> hmm. Well, is the band there in the background? Is that what's on that stage back there? So it's not the band they're looking at. Right. I don't think so. <gasps> oh, I know. I bet they're looking for their friends. Have they come yet? Hmm. Very nice. Very nice. So how are those two ladies similar to one another? Mm -hmm. Is there a sameness to them? Their hair almost looks the same color. I can tell you right away, my girls would, if you asked that question, my girls would have 
skipped right to how they're different. <laughs> it would have had a strong preference for the dress of the girl in the foreground. Ah, okay. Opposed to the girl in black. So, <laughs> I think they're mother daughter, don't you? Mm. Or at least older sister. They do look like they're related somehow, don't they? There yeah. is an air of sameness. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, you took my, my next question. Oh, How sorry. are they different? No, it's good. How are they different? You zeroed in on one way. Their dresses are different. Their hair different? Let's see. Is the one wearing, what is on her head? <laughs> sorry, the one in the background, the black dress. Yes. She's wearing a hat? I think so. When, when, some kind? when Tim and I were looking over this painting and just having a conversation together, we talked about how we think she may be the only woman in the painting with a hat. Yeah, that's why I think she looks more matronly in that yeah. she's a mother or an aunt. She's not a friend. Right. And yeah. what what's different about her dress than everybody else's dresses? Which her? The The lady in the back, the... Hat lady. The hat. <laughs> Besides the fact that it's a dark color. Yeah. Does anyone else have a dark colored dress on? No, that and that does seem to, if you are a reader of novels of this century, <laughs> usually the matrons are wearing dark, sober colors and headdresses, and the young girls are almost always have flowers in their hair instead. Well, it's often, their own oftentimes because they were widows by a young age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, black black is often associated with mourning, right? And and especially here, it would be a little odd to be here in in mourning, wouldn't it? What what's going on in this scene? It's quite a street dance. Mm -hmm. It does. <laughs> it it reminds me of New Year's Eve when I took the children to, up to Raleigh to see the Chinese lanterns, and there was just uh -huh. people and lights and music and just things everywhere. It's very exciting. Yeah, does this does this painting have a lot of movement to it? It feels like it to me. Yes. It's an interesting how how something that's static can still yeah. have an an uh, air of motion to it. So between the dancing and the lights and mm -hmm. looking at different angles. Mm -hmm. Well, Do let's think. Oh, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> Do you think this is inside or outside? Well, there's trees. Trees look like <laughs> outdoor trees. Right? But there's lights. <laughs> right? It's a little confusing, a little ambiguous, isn't it? Which one it is? For sure. Wait, well, yeah. We can't say that they're under a cover of any kind because on the left, everyone's got light on them. From the sunshine right. so unless unless it's really evening and the sun's coming down super low and across <laughs> well we've looked at we've talked about um what we see but if you were in this scene what do you think you might hear i'm i'm getting very specific so you'll have to forgive me anyway <laughs> all my favorites i am hearing a chopin waltz because i love <laughs> chopin and I, and you know, this is French and about the same time. So I feel like it's Chopin waltz going on in the background. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hearing. And, and also lots of chatter because there's lots of groups talking as well as dancing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we I think skirts swishing also. This fabric <laughs> is going to be noisy fabric, I think. There, and there's netting and petticoats and things under it. So you're going to hear a lot of swishing. Lots of swishing. <laughs> Does no, this look? Oh, go ahead, Lee. I was saying, well, so because it is French, I think you're correct. Well, I, I originally was thinking when you asked music, I was thinking because oh, of the straw hats and the clothes of the air. I was thinking, you know, Casey would waltz with the strawberry blonde or Daisy, Daisy, give me your bicycle to, <laughs> or get right on my bicycle, whatever that song is. <laughs> there was lots of songs that were very, um, that was pop music, but it was like sweet songs in the 1880s and 90s, mm -hmm. right? You know, it was after the Civil War and mm -hmm. people were tired of ugliness. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. Well, Lee, you had a good, you had a good point that um, after the Civil War, people were tired of ugliness. 
does this remind you of anything else that you know? And Lee, you kind of alluded to that already with the lanterns. Does this scene remind you of anything that may be familiar to you? I can't think of anything, Kelly, but you obviously have something in mind. <laughs> Give me a clue. <laughs> well, even just thinking about um, large gatherings of people um, and festivities like New Year's Eve. I think when I look at it, you know, I think about people who are celebrating in that way, maybe. Yeah, I go to lots of parties and concerts and things, so I'm really fortunate to just have this kind of joy around me fairly often. Mm. What is it about it that makes you associate it with joy, mm. Lee? The colors and the movement and that it's outside. And I mean, that matronly woman, she's got her arm around the daughter and she's so happy looking. Mm -hmm. that, that's, they're all happy here. Yeah, yeah. Look at all the faces. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are a lot of faces here. A lot. And they're all they're all happy, right? You see a lot of smiles and mm -hmm. well, you've got the contrast between the guys in the straw hat and the one on the left who has the black hat, and he looks like a bad guy. He doesn't look as happy as the <laughs> other ones. Kelly and I were thinking that he looked actually a little bit like Renoir. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> if you look at the little, little maybe little the snapshot there. Little self-portrait stuck right. in. Right. Painting himself into a memory, maybe. <laughs> And was the Ulan Mall of the Galette, which was what a Parker city in Paris. Moulin actually means a mill. So if you think of Moulin Rouge, which is not not quite as innocent as a scene, but <laughs> that, that's you know the, it's symbolized by the red windmill. So Moulin literally means a mill, and there is near this site of this painting there is a an old mill that be, that is now today a restaurant. Mm. Um, I think it's up in Montmartre where all the artists would go to paint during Renoir's day. So um, I, I'm assuming they're just near that mill, that old mill. <laughs> and the word ball would make you think this is a like ball. a ball, which might lead your children if you were having a conversation about this card, thinking about other fairy tales like Cinderella or... Mm -hmm. Um, those types of events where there would be balls where the ladies would dress up and mm -hmm. they'd be escorted, which would be a fun thing to do with your family. Looking at this, mm -hmm. escort them to the dinner table. <laughs> I was also thinking about baby ways that we train our kids to look. So when Benjamin was little, he was fascinated by the book, Go Dog Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I still cannot hardly open the covers because I read that so many times, <laughs> In, in one, you know, it's all about the dogs getting to their dog party, their riotous mm -hmm. dog party at the end, but all the dogs have colored scarves on. And there, there's one image that stretches across two pages where the dogs start up close to you and then they recede into the, and he would spend forever looking at that and going, trying to figure out what's the pattern and the color of the scarves and what color scarves are the dogs wearing that you can't see. And I was thinking probably my kids would do that with this painting too. They'd be trying to stretch off into the distance and see what colors those people had on and what they were doing, what their expressions are, because they're just a little mysterious back there at the back. Yeah. I was talking about the back. I'm wondering if that thing that looks like green teeth is a landmark that people would have recognized seeing this picture and that's why he put it in there that's very very funny you say that lee that's exactly what kelly called those when they look at this picture as <laughs> <is> green teeth <laughs> they do um, but that, but that is the sort of thing that our younger kids would look at it and say look it's green teeth right mm -hmm. and and then to be able to, to enter into that with them and not mm -hmm. correct them about it but to just let them see it for what they see is just fine. Uh, you know, Renoir is not going to be upset that you thought that those were green teeth. <laughs> um, yeah, it's too bad that modernity thinks of art history class as art history, mm -hmm. right? That drives it out of them. And so, so like, well, Tim, tell me what I have to look at this for so I can pass the test. Mm -hmm. Right. And shuts you down right away. Right. Yep. So, I think another thing you said, Joy Lee, is one of the things you see in this. There's also a lot of romance in this picture, isn't there? Mm -hmm. and, and by romance, I don't just mean boys and girls dancing together, because clearly there's that. But that sort of romantic 
idea. Uh, what what about this sort of speaks romance or romantic to you? Well, the, looking at the forefront, I mean, the longer I look at, it, the more you see, right? And so that is the mother, and the person facing her is his, her son. You can tell by how he's drawn that he's young. And they've come together as a family and, you know, they're dressed up and they're waiting for their friends and there's music in the background. And all of that speaks of just the romance of life and the delight of being outdoors and alive. And they may not know anybody else in the back, but they feel like they're part of that community. And that's all romantic. Yeah. Th thanks for the story, Lee. That's that's great. That's uh, and actually and you get... had a different story. Yeah. Okay. Tell us your story, Jennifer. <laughs> I think he looks old enough to be the girl's suitor. I'm wondering if Mama is checking him out and <laughs> deciding if he's worthy. I don't know. She, I mean, she looks like she likes him. So to me, oh, it, okay. to me, it looks like the older sister and younger sister. And mm -hmm. the older sister is introducing younger sister to wow. a young man who she thinks would be a good match. Yes. And I think she's holding some flowers in her oh. lap there. Uh, Perhaps he's brought them for her. Yeah, it's hard to, the painting's not clear at that point because they could still be like in his lap because they're on this side of the bench. Right. Just, yeah, there's, just like we enjoy reading about these in the stories, this is so enjoyable to look at because it is young people celebrating life together and getting to know one another and getting to learn how to relate to the opposite sex. Even if they're not courting couples, they're learning how to be together and, um, and celebrate community together so it's fun to fun to look at them how much do you guys think this is not necessarily the question for a kid but how much do you guys think the fact that it's impressionistic adds to the joy i was trying to think of there are, there probably aren't very many dark impressionistic pictures are there there are some pretty moody ones um, um but the, well, the scream i guess is dark right and that's impressionistic <laughs> Yeah, there are. But here, I think, yeah, the, the to me, it's a little bit of that ha that haziness, like that um, romance. our mid 20th century film uh, people picked up, picked up on this, the filmmakers picked up on this too, right? And they would put that sort of um, the soft mm -hmm. gel on the lights and, and give everything sort of that hazy feel to, to enhance sort of that dreamlike state. And I think that that's a little bit what's going on here is uh, when we get into a big party like this, we have a good time, but there's a little bit of that sort of fuzziness that comes along with being in a big crowd and having a really good time. A lot of, of Renoir's paintings have that, that feel to them. They're, they are joyous. I mean, my other favorite of his is two girls, two sisters at the piano having a music lesson and it has bright and joyous colors and they're clearly enjoying playing the piano together. I think he, his paintings are more joyous than some. Well, here's one more story and then we probably are almost out of time, but maybe Tim's right. And uh, this is the young beau the mother's really interested in, but that little girl is looking past him. I know. She's looking for somebody else. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Not interested in this conversation. And maybe that's because she's the chaperone. It could be completely oh. the other way around. I don't know. True. Isn't that nice though that there's no right answer? Yeah. Leaves great. scope scope for the imagination, right? <laughs> to be able to fill in all the details. <laughs> yep. And so, you know, from here you can take this card and uh, you might do the Kelly project and say, okay, now draw the, the people who are over to the right of, of our young man who are missing from the paint, from the painting, but are also at the party. Or you might ask them to tell, to write their story. What's going on here? Or to uh, some, of, some of our kids would love to go play some dress up and take some of the things that they've, that they see here and try and, and recreate the moment. Uh, so there's lots of places to go with your with your students and not just your young students uh, a challenge kid maybe has some interest in in dressmaking and could go and recreate or or pattern or sketch some of these things uh, uh or do some research on on what kind of event this might have been or why the men are wearing so many different kinds of hats in this picture <laughs>
Tim, I think my creativity is in good company, friend. <laughs> Well, so are you closing us out for today, Lee? Yeah, that was great. That was a 15 minute conversation on one picture among people who aren't in the same room together. And so I just really appreciate the unity that we can have because of our time that we've spent in person and our time with the same curriculum and our time with the same goals of working with our children, even though our families are so different. We have one and only one goal to help them to know God and make them known. So thank you, my friends, for being here and helping us uh, one more time. Enjoy each other and hopefully our listeners. So we'll talk next week about classical music. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bye. Bye.